Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to this Sunday, September 13th. Thank you, Carol. Maureen. Uh, it really is the 15th, so don't mind the date on the front of your... Uh, I guess I was so uh, focused on trying to get a beautiful painting of the stars is what I was focusing on instead of the date. Or I could be 60. <laughs> well, our harvest dinner <clears throat> is right around the corner, Wednesday, September 25th. And sign-up sheets are still there up the foyer, our markets, for items we need and help we need. Are there any other announcements? Do you want to say anything about the wine sale, maybe? Me? Yeah? The wine sale? Well, I just been thinking that it's really going to come up quick after the dinner. Yeah. <laughs> so the first Saturday in October. That's what has been yep. free. We've talked about October 5th. October 5th, yep. Yes, and that's, I think, the Apple Fest, so we thought we might get some traffic through here. Um, how big this rummy sale is going to be, I don't know. Um, it's not like the old ones where we had just people come and bring everything and dump it off, and we took care of it all. Um, we're kind of thinking a couple of years ago we did it where everybody, if you've got stuff that you want rummage you know, to get rid of, um, and you would be willing to come and sit at a table and kind of bring your own stuff. And you sign up for a table. Yeah, and then anything that's left over, you take home with you also to get rid of it. Um, yeah. We're not Otherwise, it just gets to be way too much work for all of us, I guess, as limited as we're getting. So if you've got some stuff and you're willing to come sit, I think we'll do it from 9 to 2. Um, and we'll have tables. You can have a table. Just let us know if you're going to be here. And then we ask that all the proceeds will get donated to the church to the window fund. Okay. Thank you, Lenny. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Posted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. so everybody should uh, have taped in front of them this Beautiful uh, diagram photo of the Old Testament flow of the Old Testament story. And what we are doing this fall, now and through until the start of Advent, is what is called the Narrative Lectionary. It was an experiment back in 2011 at Luther Seminary. And what Luther Seminary felt 13 years ago is that people had lost the flow of the narrative of the Old Testament. And they thought, well, instead of every Sunday doing what we call the revised common lectionary, which we follow, they came up with what they call the narrative lectionary. And in the fall, they would go through major stories of the Old Testament and then, starting with Christmas, then he would pick up the gospel and then fairly chronologically move through a gospel. And so it repeats. So each gospel gets their own year. So when we come to Christmas this year, we will be in Luke's gospel story. But until then, we will be going through the Old Testament stories. And when you think about it, Jesus obviously did not have a Bible. The scriptures that Jesus would have known would have been the Psalms and all of the Old Testament stories. So that's what we are going to do this fall. And so we will keep them uh, taped in front of you as we move through some of these stories. We won't do them all. Each again, it's over four years. But we will keep them taped so you can refer back to this. And it's a wonderful, uh, with all the little pictures, just a wonderful flow. And how you read the uh, this diagram is kind of like a snake. You start in the upper left-hand corner with creation, and then you flow across, and then we will come to the story today of Abraham, and then it goes all the way back to the left and just kind of like snakes its way down. And so, our, obviously, our story today is of Father Abraham. 
I invite you to join me in confession as found in your book. <coughs> we hear the call to trust in God always. We remember how Abraham dared to believe in God's promises. But belief like that is hard to come by. We forget the wisdom of Scripture. Which reminds us of the mind of the evil of all the ourselves. Hear us, Holy One, as we confess our frailty and failings. Assurance of forgiveness. Hear the good news. By faith we have been saved, our hearts washed clean, refreshed, revived, and renewed, empowered by the Holy Spirit, live as ones who are forgiven and freed, giving thanks to God. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you to sing our gathering song. Open your ears, O faithful people. Hymn 519. as numerous as the stars. You have also promised us that we might live under those stars as your faithful people, faithful and loved. Show us how to live as your people and all to your children, which will share the same things and the same Amen. I invite you to join me in Psalm 33 as found in your bulletin. Happy is the nation whose God is the Lord. <laughs> Truly, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him. To, live, to deliver their soul from death. Our soul waits for the Lord. Our heart is glad in him. Let your hesed, your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us. In the narrative lectionary, the focus again this fall will be on the Old Testament lesson, but they always try to pair a verse from the New Testament that pairs with the Old. So, the Holy Gospel according to Luke, the third chapter and the eighth verse. Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Gospel of our Lord. 
So Jesus would have absolutely known the story of Abraham. So right now, I invite you to look at our Old Testament story sheet. So last Sunday, although it was, the focus was on the blessing of our new windows, and they are closed, the curtains today, for a purpose. But last Sunday, uh, just an awesome Sunday with David Potter uh, playing the organ and uh, blessing our windows, being able to see out. And we focused on light and creation, and the beautiful creation that we can now see out our windows. We are truly blessed that way. And then, following the flow of the Old Testament stories, there you see the tree of life. Well, yes, that was the tree of life in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve. Well, that didn't go so well. And then, the story of Cain and Abel. Do you know a really simple way to remember who's Cain and who's Abel? Like a mnemonic? Think of uh, a Cain, C-N-E, beating somebody. Cain. So Cain killed Abel. So already, we are in a very simple and violent world. Of course, then the flood, Noah. The world was so evil by then, God decided to start over with the family of Noah. It's really not a wonderful children's story when you think about it. But the flood... Noah's family rescued, and then Noah actually himself doesn't do so well. And then the families become populated again. And remember, they're all speaking one language. And then we have the Tower of Babel, where they tried to build to God, to the heavens. And that was because God, the people trying to be gods themselves. So God mixed up all of the languages. And then just a few short chapters there in Genesis 11, stories of a family leading up to really it was Abraham's father. And then right in the corner, we are, would have been Genesis 12. And that is where God promised to Abram and Sarai that they would be blessed with a family with numerous descendants. Because God was going to try a new approach and focus with just the start of one family, one very unlikely family. And so now today, we start with that story continuing with Abraham and Sarah. The story of God's covenant with Abraham, now still called Abram. After these things, what God had promised in Genesis 12, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O oh Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no offspring, and so a slave born in my house is to be my heir. But the word of the Lord came to Abram, This man Eliezer shall not be your heir, no one but your very own issue shall be your heir. So God brought Abram outside and said, Look toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to count them. Then God said to Abram, So shall your descendants be as numerous as the stars. And Abram believed the Lord and the Lord reckoned to him as 
righteousness. The story of Abram and the covenant. And just as a footnote, when the Lord reckoned to Abram as righteousness, that righteousness doesn't have a, a moral sense to it, but it's a sense of being in relationship. That's what that righteousness means, being in relationship with God. So grace and peace to you from God our Creator and from Jesus Christ, God's only Son. Amen. So we're on the story of Abraham and Sarah today. Abraham, Abram, was 75 years old. Sarah, same age, no children, barren, but God chose to focus special attention upon this elderly man and this barren woman. And God promised this very unlikely couple that they would become a great nation. Numerous descendants. The Lord would bless them so that in you all of the families of the earth shall be blessed. That's what was promised in Genesis 12. Nothing's happened. They have no children. But God is saying, no, 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 there's going to be a miracle. And Sarah and Abraham, they, they're trying to figure out what they see themselves in, in their human world and constantly trying to figure out how this is going to be. And what makes this biblical tense so, text so tense is the delay. The delay. The fulfillment of this promise. Years have passed. But if God, think about this, if God had just said, you're going to have an heir, then bam, Sarah's pregnant, that's not a very good story. Doesn't make for a good story at all. But we get this sort of gap between the promise and how it and when it's going to be fulfilled. We've read the text. We know this story. But for the characters back then, Sarah and Abraham, it was not anything like that. How is this going to be? How are we going to have children? How can this work? So it's really compelling about these promises delayed. God's promises delayed and the anxiety that can create. Now, this is just a very short, simple story from yesterday about anxiety created when something's been promised. So, Tony and uh, Matt Deach's wife, Courtney, we ran the 10K race yesterday in Iron River around Spider Lake. And we got to just over the halfway point where Spider Lake Road connects up with Highway A. And there was a lady there, it was a water point, and she's trying to encourage us racers, and she says, it's all downhill from here. And I haven't been on Highway A in a, in a while, but I looked at her and I says, are you promising me? Are you, is this a promise? It's all downhill? She's like, oh yeah, it's all downhill. <laughs> it wasn't. <laughs> it starts out downhill, Highway A flat, nice beautiful downhill, but you know what? Maybe if you're in a car, you don't notice it. But when us three looked up and saw that hill leading up towards Mill Road and Iron River, I'm like, oh, that's a hill. When you're running, you're racing, your heart rate, you know, pretty high. They're like, I should not have believed her promise. I might have had a different race strategy, not knowing that hill was there. But anxiety raised when you don't see a promise coming true. So God takes Abraham outside. The Lord reassures Abram that he will have his own biological child. And more than that, God takes Abram outside, outside into the night air, and invites him to count the stars. And I think there's a little divine humor in this story. Well, not that Abram back then had the telescopes we have today to know about the billions of stars and galaxies 
that we're beginning to discover and understand billions of stars out there. But go on, count billions upon billions of stars, Abram, if you think you can, and so shall your descendants be. God gives Abram the gift of a nightly visual and a tangible reminder of the promise. Every night, Abram can step outside his tent, look up into the sky, to the galaxies, and somehow believe in the miracle and the promise that his descendants will be as numerable as those uncountable stars. So God takes Abram outside. And I think God had to. Because maybe Abram, in my mind, is like a little child, like a baby. What was one of the first things you learned with a newborn? When it's crying and it's really colicky? Sometimes you can take that baby and step outside and they're like, huh, something's different. And they stop crying. Are you doing that with, with nothing else work at night? You step outside with that great grandbaby? Yeah. There's just something about going outside. It, ca it catches your attention, even a little baby. So God took Abram outside. And it's like, this is going to happen for you. Go outside and look at the stars. But we're kind of like, yeah, the star, yada, yada, yada. Like, we see the stars. We don't have light pollution out here. We see the stars. So it's interesting, though, know, that this sign of the promise that's been given to Abraham is something that's been there every single day of Abraham's life. So yes, get outside. But also this promise. Are the stars mundane? I mean, they're not like the northern lights. Those are not mundane. But stars are not at all mundane. They're always here, though. So Abram, though, he's looking up at the stars, and it's not like the birth story of Jesus. There's not that nativity star that the wise men follow. There's not a star that lands over the manger. There's no star that came right over Abram. And it wasn't like a shooting star. It wasn't like a plane that won't honor his name up in the sky. You know, that would have been really cool. But the sign of the promise is the stars. Like, just turn your head up. The stars, always there. And it's not just about them appearing, but I would submit there is a power, a real power when you choose to give your attention to something or what we're able to give our attention to. To be able to give your attention to the stars and see in them their miraculousness, even though they're there all the time. So God is speaking to Abram through the eyes of his heart. It's a different kind of miracle. It's not the burning bush that Moses will get later in the story. It's quiet. And that's what really is cool about this text. God has promised Abraham something that seems impossible. But he can look outside and look at it and see that God has already done things that seem impossible. And if God can do that, then truly God can do the miracles. And this is the miracle. You know, the stars are fading in and out, and that's kind of how our life is. We believe in the promises of God, but I invite you to look up and just zero in on one star. It will come back. Just one star. That's your star. You are a spiritual descendant of Abraham. And those promises made to Abraham continue to us today. Abraham's not going to have it easy. There's no prosperity promised for Abram or his descendants. They're going to be sent into slavery. We'll get the story next week of Joseph, one of the 12 Abraham's descendants. 
but God gives us what we need to carry on. And when you look at the sky, may you be affirmed in God's promises that came to us through the birth of the Savior. Amen. So you probably didn't notice these stars were here all during the beginning of the service. And we'll continue to be here. For our hymn today, we will sing, Be Thou My Vision. I'm on an ELC clergy page on, on Facebook, and this particular post was for uh, these, the clergy was, tell us what one of your favorite hymns is. And I was really surprised how many times Be Thou My Vision was mentioned. So I invite you to sing. Hymn 793, Be Thou My Vision, and for our online congregation, I will say, Be Thou Our Vision, and I invite you to respond with, O Ruler of All. 793. <laughs> cannot be destroyed. You promise us a feast and a peace without end. And you hear our prayers. We pray for your world, wounded and scarred. Be thou our vision. We pray for your church, divided and angry. Unite us in mission and grow us in love. Be thou our vision. We pray for the lost, the forgotten, the lonely. Gather them in and show us how to love. Be thou our vision. We pray for the addicted. Save them and strengthen them. Be thou our vision. We pray for those who have no hope. Give them faith in you. Be thou our vision. 
We pray for the greedy. Make them generous. Be thou our vision. We pray for the poor. Sustain them and give them hope. Be thou our vision. We pray for all those whose burdens we carry in our hearts and offer them up to you. Heal them, comfort them, guide them, make them whole. Those we now name silently in our hearts or aloud. Be thou our vision. In obedience to Christ and with love for our neighbors, let us bring these prayers to God. Generous God, you pour out blessings and cover us with gifts of love. Accept our prayers that they may proclaim your mercy and embody your grace. For in Jesus' name we ask it. Be thou our vision. Amen. The peace and love of Christ be with you all. I invite you to share that side of peace with one another. Be well in Christ. We continue now with the Holy Communion and the great thanks. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord and our God. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty Merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. By the leading of a star, he was shown forth to all nations. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth, and the whole stuff happened, we praise your name and join their unending hymn.
this bread and share the body of the Christ. Come to the banquet and now all is done.
the body is one of our Lord Jesus Christ, great that he will preserve you in eternal life. Receive the benediction. The God of all hope fill you with joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We sing our sending song, Great is Thy Faithfulness, hymn 733, and I invite you to stand. Christ is with you. Amen. Go in peace, sir.